So thank you, Dr. Thurstone, for joining us this evening. Uh, and thank you for, uh, for what you've prepared for us. And we look forward to hearing what you have to offer now. That's great. Thank you so much for the invitation, Corey. And uh, thanks everybody for being here. It's really good to see everybody's faces. And if you can share your video, that's fabulous. It makes me feel like I'm not alone. Uh, but if you would prefer not to, that's fine too. Um, let's see here, Corey, my understanding, I'm talking for about 45 minutes and then we're gonna have some time for question and answer. Is that still correct? Yeah, yeah, right about 45 minutes or so and then some Q and A. All right, sounds great. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share some, I prepared uh, some slides here for us. So I'll go ahead and share that. All right, are we good for the slides? And uh, we'll go ahead and get started. So yes, I'm Chris Thurstone. I'm a child psychiatrist. I'm an addiction psychiatrist. I'm the director of behavioral health here at Denver Health, which is the safety net hospital for Denver. And I'm a professor of psychiatry at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. And um, this is uh, these are my disclosures here. I think whenever we're talking about marijuana, we have to talk about people's real and potential uh, conflicts of interest. So uh, Denver Health uh, pays my salary. I wrote a book uh, for everything I would want parents to know about addiction. And um, I'm in the Army Reserve, as Corey mentioned, and I have a grant from Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration to expand mental health services at our safety net hospital. So those are my real and perceived potential conflicts of interests. And uh, just wanted to start with this. This is something that we use in the Army. It's a stress continuum, and we've adapted it for healthcare now, especially in this pandemic and post-pandemic mental health wave, uh, just to check in with our teams and our people. And I invite people just to look at this here. I'm sure everybody's had a day and a week, and it's uh, even later for you than it is for me right now. So um, the green zone is I'm ready, I'm thriving, I got this. And uh, the yellow zone is I'm surviving, but something isn't perfectly right. And the orange zone is I'm a little bit injured and struggling and can't keep up. And the red zone is in crisis. And so I encourage people just to acknowledge where they're at uh, today and right now, and uh, to think about what you need to do to take care of yourself. Um, big believer that there is no health without mental health. I uh, divided this presentation into four points here. Uh, one, I wanted to talk specifically about Senate Bill 711, which was the North Carolina Compassionate Care Act, which my understanding passed the state Senate, but then it was not taken up by the House. And so it'll be reconsidered in the next legislative season. And I thought it might be helpful to go through some of the details of that and what that really means. And then I was gonna talk about the Colorado experience with um, medicalizing, commercializing, legalizing marijuana. That way, I think that'll help uh, people in North Carolina have some informed consent around this process. And then I was gonna talk about some of the concerns uh, from a medical and public health standpoint with respect to marijuana use. And this mostly has to do with cars and kids is what I'll focus on. And then uh, finally, I'll finish with some summary and what I think are some recommendations. And we'll make sure we have time for conversation at the end. So hopefully you will be uh, an active, talkative uh, group. Um, we can do our questions uh, in the chat or raising your hand, however you'd like to do that. Um, starting with first with this uh, Senate Bill 711, the North Carolina Compassionate Care Act. And what exactly did that do? I took some time to read through the entire act actually, so I could, because the devil really is always in these details here. And so I really wanted to understand what was happening. And so I uh, summarized some main points here for you. And what it would do, it would allow possession of a 30 day supply in any form, um, possessing up to 1.5 ounces. So in any form is a key detail because that includes then automatically concentrates, butane, hash oil, 
edibles, and it's just something to know about ahead of time that that's a very important uh, part of that sentence. Um, allows for cannabis and cannabis infused products. So again, um, allows for concentrates, edibles, wax, things like that, um, not just uh, the leaf, for example. The qualifying conditions are cancer, epilepsy, HIV, AIDS, ALS, Crohn's disease, sickle cell, Parkinson's, PTSD, multiple sclerosis, cachexia, nausea, any terminal condition, and somebody receiving hospice. And we can talk about that. Um, PTSD is squarely in my so scope of practice as a physician, as a psychiatrist and a two-time OEF veteran. Um, we'll talk more about that. It allows for up to two caregivers. So you have the patient and then the patient can designate two caregivers who can grow and transport and um, provide this person with their marijuana. And so I think that's an important detail because it creates a fair amount of complexity in the system when patients can have multiple caregivers um, and just complexity to enforcement. Uh, creates medical, this is a key, key, key part of this right here. It creates medical cannabis centers that are evenly spread out throughout the state and can be open from seven in the morning to seven in the evening. So that's a huge piece of this, that it's, um, it's going beyond making this accessible to people, but it's really commercializing these, uh, the sale of marijuana with medical uh, cannabis centers and evenly spread throughout the state. So even in Colorado, count various counties, in fact, many counties have opted out of um, commercializing marijuana. But in North Carolina, that would not be possible under this legislation. Um, so it wouldn't just be happening in Durham and, uh, you know, in, in some Orange County, some of the um, more liberal counties, it would be happening throughout the state. Um, <clears throat> it would allow suppliers to cultivate and own and operate one or more centers and one or more production facilities. So again, you're really commercializing this. You're not just going to have mom and pop shops. You're going to have um, you can have multiple centers. It's going to um, allow for people to transport and deliver. So this is even going beyond what we've had in Colorado, where you can designate people to transport this and do home delivery for you. And so you can just imagine the complexities from a law enforcement perspective of uh, enforcing this. You have caregivers, you have transporters, you have cultivators, you have the cannabis centers, you have it gets very tricky, even trickier as I go on here. Uh, you need to be a licensed physician with a DEA license to see the patient quarterly and then yearly. So technically you only need to be a licensed physician. Myself as a psychiatrist could be recommending uh, marijuana for somebody's cancer, for example. Um, and we saw that a lot. Uh, in fact, the biggest prescriber of of marijuana in Colorado, medical marijuana in Colorado was a radiologist. Uh, so that's a, a really key point as well. Um, patients have to be 18 or above. And um, if they're under 18, they need a signature from a guardian. So a couple things, uh, just to note, 50%, 50 percent, five zero percent of 18 year olds are still in high school. Uh, that's a major complexity. Uh, and um, under 18 with a signature for the guardian. There's no language in there requiring a notarized signature or something like that that would really um, make it sure that the guardian is in approval. And it's only one guardian who needs to approve. Medical Cannabis Production Committee would help regulate the industry, but interestingly, there would be two industry representatives of the 11 members um, on that commission. So you have a little bit of the fox guarding the hen house with that one. It would allow for medical cannabis suppliers um, who need to be a North Carolina resident 
but they can have a non-resident partner. So that's a key part of this as well, that it will allow for big marijuana companies from out of state to come in and open up medical cannabis centers um, as partners. Can't be within a thousand feet of a school um, unless the um, person is using within a private residence. But that's interesting because it creates complexities around in North Carolina. People like to sit on their front porch. And uh, so would people be able to then sit on their front porch, back porch and smoke marijuana and then have the smell permeate the neighborhood? And in Colorado that went up to the courts and it was the courts decided that yes, since it was legal, that would be allowable. It creates a testing industry to test the marijuana products um, for potency and other things. So you have another industry that then is being created. Allows for signage with logo and name. Does not allow for billboards, radio, TV ads, although that would be a violation of free speech. And in Colorado, we had similar legislation that was um, found to be unconstitutional and was immediately challenged and overcome. So it's really hard to once something is legal in this way to regulate the free speech around it. And then it allows for an end North Carolina cannabis research program uh, that would study, do clinical trials and things like that. So that's uh, basically in a nutshell of what that um, piece of legislation was about. And um, these were the senators who voted for and against it here. And I'll just let you take a look at this here. Uh, the sponsors were Nickel, who is NC13, a Democrat, and uh, then I may be pronouncing his name wrong, Rabone, um, is, uh, was also the co-sponsor. Um, already, just for some more context, um, marijuana is pretty decriminalized in North Carolina. A uh, simple possession of marijuana up to a half an ounce is um, at most a $200 fine. Uh, so people are, just to be clear, people are not going to prison or jail in North Carolina for simple possession of marijuana use. Um, this is just another graphic I made here of the industry that would be created under this piece of legislation. You would have production facilities. So that's the cultivation as well as the, um, the edibles. That would, those would be places where, where people would make the edibles, like the cakes and candies and cookies and pizzas that are marijuana infused. Those would be production facilities. Then you would have the medical cannabis centers, which are the retail outlets. Um, then you would have the patients, the caregivers, and the delivery systems around that. Then you would have the middle line there, the testing centers to test for potency and other things. And then you have the um, North Carolina Medical Cannabis Program Fund, uh, which needs to be funded uh, out of this. Um, and 10% of revenues from the medical cannabis centers would go towards funding this regulatory system. So the NC Medical Cannabis Program Fund is the research arm. And then you have the Medical Cannabis um, Product Commission, which I mentioned has two industry representatives on it to help regulate this. So it's quite a regulatory infrastructure. We know that from our history with tobacco and alcohol that taxes pay for about a 10th of the actual cost of the social costs plus the regulatory costs uh, related to substance use. So um, it's my hypothesis, this, is, this will be expensive. Um, just doing some math, um, I went to Duke, I was a math major, and I thought this might be helpful just to go through a little bit of math here. Um, so I looked up on the internet, one cup of butane oil is 135 grams. And if butane hash oil is 90% THC by weight, 
there are 122 grams of THC in one cup of butane hash oil. If a serving size is 10 milligrams of THC, then there are 12,200 doses of THC in one cup of butane hash oil. So just to give you a sense here, when you're talking about concentrates, uh, they're quite concentrated. And um, when you're allowing for 1.5 ounces um, for people to possess, that can be a lot of THC if you're talking about concentrates. Um, so I just put this here. Uh, one of the benefits about getting older is just being able to say what I think, but this bill really is about creating an industry. Um, as I showed you, the medical centers and production facilities. And uh, the way I read this has a lot less to do with um, really making available on a compassionate basis marijuana. Um, the Colorado experience. So we went down this road. We've been going down this road since 2009 is when we commercialized marijuana. And so we actually, we have some data about what you all would be getting into if you did decide to go down this road. And I thought it might be helpful to share some of this here. So these are data from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, past month prevalence of marijuana use. This is for 12 to 17 year olds in Colorado and the United States as a whole. And what you can see here and on the bottom is by year. So that's 2002, 2003, 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006. What do we see here? Remember I said it was 2009 is when we commercialized marijuana. So right about that commercializing time period, 2009 to 2015, we saw a pretty clear bump in marijuana use among adolescents in Colorado that was not seen in the United States as a whole, which are the green bars. So again, a, a bump in marijuana use among teens right around our uh, commercialization process. Fortunately, um, looks like things may have steadied out a little bit in more recent years, so that's good. Where there's absolutely no debate at all is uh, that the use among 18 to 25 year olds has really gone up significantly and stayed up. So again, you have the percent you reporting past month marijuana use and you have on the bottom there is by year. And you can see in 2009, just that it really took off um, in terms of prevalence of use in Colorado. That as a physician, child psychiatrist, I'm still very concerned about. The brain is developing until the age of 24. And this is a really critical time of social development, relational development, career development. And we'll talk more about that in a second. These are some of the products that became available when things were commercialized. And I would think people in North Carolina might be familiar with this story. It's a um, big, having been through big tobacco uh, and tobacco companies making a more addictive product and a more potent product. We've seen the same thing with respect to marijuana use. So when we commercialized marijuana, uh, we had these new um, products on the market. So shatter is on the top left uh, because it's kind of like a little piece of glass. And that's about 20 to 30 percent THC, THC being the main active ingredient of marijuana by weight. And wax looks, they call it earwax because it kind of looks like earwax. Similarly, 20 to 30 plus percent THC by weight, um, which Marijuana typically up until the 80s, 90s, early 2000s was only two to 3% THC by weight. So it's much more concentrated. Butane hash oil on the bottom, which uh, can be up to 90% THC by weight. And what is frequently used to infuse into various food or edible products to make them marijuana infused. Uh, then we also had the advent of just different types of 
they call them edibles. You can't call them food because if you call them food, it'd need to be regulated by the Food and Drug Administration, which is federal. But so edibles, uh, we have the THC infused candies and cookies and suckers and the Chiba Chews on the top there um, are like little Tootsie Rolls. And the North Carolina legislation talks about not trying not to make products that appeal to children. And we tried the same thing in Colorado, but the marijuana industry argued that adults like these products also. Adults also like candy. And it's true, adults do like candy. So um, we, uh, that, we, that was a battle that was lost on the prevention front and uh, the um, edibles uh, were developed. Um, the marijuana infused sodas as well and drinks. And you can see there, does anybody remember what I said was a typical dose of THC was 10 milligrams. So these sodas have 100 milligrams in them. And so this has led to some really unfortunate overconsumption experiences because the time to maximum blood concentration after consuming marijuana orally is about two and a half hours. So people can consume and then not feel anything and then keep consuming until they have an overconsumption experience. And there have been some really sad cases of people developing psychosis and getting aggressive and shooting themselves, shooting other people, jumping off a balcony. Um, so that's really something to think about in terms of the, pro the potency of these products. Um, and then as well, these are on the left there, that's a little vape pen. And on the right, of course, is the typical marijuana flower that people might smoke. And then uh, this here is relatively new since the commercialization of marijuana. And this is a dab rig. And so people can put a little bit of concentrate on the top left part there. And then the concentrate gets heated up very hot and then can be smoked, inhaled from there. And it's uh, just a really um, more potent way of using marijuana than using, for example, um, a blunt or a joint. Uh, again, um, products like, you know, can't, chocolate as well. And you can see the packaging and endorsed by uh, Snoop Dogg. And so you have celebrities who have their own lines of things. And again, uh, once something is legal, there's First Amendment rights to um, package and market as as you see fit so also some more candies there um, gummy squares and uh, um, the swedish worms there more chiba chews cookies and all of the the north carolina legislation would allow for all of that um, the way i read it all of those edibles and then uh, so Colorado also tried to have a ban on billboard, radio, TV, advertising, immediately challenged and immediately struck down by the Supreme Court of Colorado as against free speech. So again, um, good intentions to try to limit the advertising marketing, but once uh, once this is opened up, then there's free speech laws around this as well. And so you see here in Colorado, Santa Claus advertising marijuana in the Denver Post. And you see um, cartoon advertising on the right here in a, uh, the Denver Westward um, newspaper, as well as coupon advertising, which we know from our history with Big Tobacco really appeals to youth who are price sensitive. All right, uh, so more of the Colorado experience. And these are, I'm gonna go through some data and some studies that we've published because we've researched. This uh, rather meticulously. So I mentioned a study we published in 2014 on the bottom of 2011. 
and on the y-axis proportion of marijuana positive drivers. So um, these were looking at traffic fatalities in Colorado and did the driver test positive for marijuana, yes or no, by year. And 2009 is when we commercialized marijuana and we saw a significant increase in traffic fatalities in which the driver tested positive for marijuana. And the uh, dotted line below it is the United States as a whole. And we did not see that similar increase in other states that did not have commercialized marijuana. Uh, this is percent of all traffic deaths where a driver tested positive for marijuana by year. And so again, you can see commercialization 2009, it was 9%, jumping up to 14%, now 21%. So again, more drivers testing positive for marijuana involved in traffic deaths. So I think this is an important issue too, because Driving is very hard to regulate for marijuana. It's not like alcohol where there's a breathalyzer and a very clear 0.08 limit. Um, there's no standard agreed upon limit for how much marijuana somebody can have in their system and still drive. And the marijuana industry was able to successfully argue in many cases that since um, some of the medical patients with using medical marijuana use every day, all day, that they've developed tolerance to the drug and therefore should be allowed to consume and drive. Um, and uh, so it's been a very sticky issue in terms of how enforcement of drugged driving with marijuana is quite complicated. Marijuana-related exposures, so these are calls to the poison center related to marijuana use. And again, you see that going up significantly. And we've published, a, there have been a few papers published around um, children and poison exposures to marijuana, even though um, we try to have the child-proof packaging, it's very difficult. Uh, this here is a purport, you know, we're in the suicide epidemic post pandemic here now and a percent of suicides in Colorado with marijuana present in the toxicology report going up significantly from 7% pre marijuana commercialization to 23%. Uh, marijuana is very clearly associated with suicide. We'll talk more that, about that in a second. There's been some talk that marijuana prevents opioid overdose and that states with medical marijuana have lower overdose rates. That's been shown not to be true. And in fact, if you look at the number of drug overdoses in Colorado around our marijuana legalization, we've really seen that go up significantly. And this is even uh, before the fentanyl epidemic hit us. Average emergency department rate. So we're seeing a lot more emergency department visits related to marijuana. As I mentioned, the potent products can lead to psychosis and panic attacks and accidents and injuries and suicide attempts and aggression. Yes, marijuana is clearly associated with aggression. And uh, so before um, legalization of marijuana, there were 660 cases of marijuana related emergency department visits per 100,000, going up significantly about 35% post marijuana legalization. So that's also been a, an important issue as well and costly in terms of lives as well as dollars. I was a uh, author on both of these papers here showing that youth in substance treatment have easy access to medical marijuana. And this is actually a really important issue here. Um, to access medical marijuana, one needs to be 18. To access recreational marijuana, one needs to be 21 years of age. And that's a huge distinction because 50% of adolescents who are 18 are still in high school. And then they become the dealers for the high school. 
And so I've been doing adolescent substance treatment for 20 years. And this is how youth are accessing marijuana now through the medical marijuana system. Again, because of that age limit difference. When the age limit is 21, it really removes it further from kids. All right, so the concerns, cars and kids. I'll just reiterate a few things here. Um, we talk about uh, the marijuana industry. We'll talk about adult use marijuana. But really, if you look at this graph here, it's the past month prevalence of marijuana use by age group. And so you see that marijuana is disproportionately used by young people, by people in that 15 to uh, 35 age group or so. So that's quite unfortunate because adolescents have this developing brain. They're more developed. They're more vulnerable to addiction as well as to the toxic effects of toxins on brain development. So uh, we know that one in six adolescents who tries marijuana develops an addiction. If somebody waits to till they're after the age of 18 to use marijuana, it's one in 11. Heavy marijuana exposure starting in adolescence and continuing into adulthood predicts up to an eight point drop in IQ from age 13 to 38. And this uh, last finding here has been repeated multiple times. You can see all of the references I have for this. Um, marijuana exposure in adolescence predicts at least a twofold increased risk of psychosis and schizophrenia in adulthood. And that is a strong association that's been repeated multiple times. Marijuana use, even weekly marijuana use, is strongly associated with decreased school achievement, worse grades, less likely to complete high school, less likely to enter college, less likely to complete college. Um, marijuana use is clearly associated with progressing to use other substances. Uh, marijuana use is associated with depression and suicide attempt. And then a new thing with all these very potent products is cannabinoid hyperemesis, which is people presenting to the emergency departments with vomiting and retching and abdominal pain and no clear medical cause. And it's attributed to marijuana use. This one here, you know, we can't do the study in humans exposing adolescents to marijuana or placebo and see who grows up to have brain damage, but we can do the study in animals and repeatedly marijuana has been shown to be toxic to brain development, has been shown to cause permanent changes in the way the brain development develops in animals. Um, <clears throat> marijuana doubles the odds of a tra traffic crash there's a joke that, oh, marijuana makes people drive safer because they drive slower. It's not true. It impairs staying in one's lane, the reaction time, maintaining distance. Um, so that's a very significant concern. And I'm about out of time, so I'll just give some quick summary and recommendations, and then we'll hopefully have a nice conversation and questions and answers. So summary and recommendations. Um, the North Carolina Compassionate Care Act is written to commercialize marijuana. So some people see a business opportunity uh, and this would uh, help them make some money with this, in my opinion. In Colorado, medicalization led to commercialization and legalization. So it's just the pathway that gets followed. It's the playbook. In Colorado, commercialization was associated with increasing use among youth increased traffic fatalities and emergency department visits. Marijuana is clearly toxic to brain and social development among adolescents. And marijuana causes traffic crashes and fatalities. Some recommendations that I would leave here, just having gone through this over the last decade firsthand. Um, one, before we even develop a whole commercialized system around medical marijuana. We need to document clearly how many people 
who could benefit from compassionate use marijuana are not able to access it. By definition, the people who are testifying in front of the state Senate um, are accessing marijuana. They're telling us that they use marijuana and it helps them with all sorts of conditions. By definition, they're accessing it. So we need to know, are people who really need compassionate use marijuana not able to access it? And if so, how many? Before we do a statewide commercialization of this. We need to document how many people who use marijuana for compassionate purposes are punished for this. In Colorado, I'm not aware of anybody who could benefit from compassionate use marijuana who was not accessing it before we commercialized it. I was not aware of anyone who was getting punished for compassionate use of marijuana. I just don't believe that um, the North Carolina State Troopers are incarcerating and arresting, um, you know, either, you know, elderly who are using it for end stage cancer or children using it for cancer. I, you know, I just have not seen any cases of that. I think a third way is available. I think it's possible to decriminalize for medical purposes. For example, there would be no punishment for people who can show compassionate medical use. And there's a way to do that without creating a whole industry that then markets and advertises and promotes use and then lobbies politicians. And it's just a cycle, just like big tobacco was in North Carolina. And truthfully, if North Carolinians feel they really need to have marijuana widely available, medicalization of marijuana is worse for kids than recreational legalization. I would rather have full-on recreational legalization of marijuana um, than have the medicalization of it. Two reasons. One, medical is available to 18-year-olds, and that then immediately makes it more accessible to adolescents. And number two, when you medicalize something, you promote it as something that's healthy and medicine, um, and it can certainly give the wrong impression to especially young people. And with that, um, if anybody wants to reach me, there's my website, uh, can send me messages to there, drthurstone.com. And I'll stop my sharing and uh, we can take whatever questions and comments and concerns people have. I, I would like to make a comment as a, by the way, great uh, presentation. Actually, I live in Colorado from 2013 to 2021. I was a professor at the School of Dental Medicine there. I would like to very quick, and I'm a father of two teenagers. Okay. This is a culture. People worship marijuana in Colorado. It's not what you think in the past. Join. No, 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 no. They think they cure, it cures cancer. They think it's the great for anybody. And let me give you an example talking to my son who's already in college here in Greensboro. And they, the school actually is Northfield High School in Northfield, Denver. That's where I used to live. And they said the school will smell like marijuana. And the teacher will say, oh, it smells like what I smoked last night. Okay. The teachers. You can't imagine how many people I know, the parents of friends of, of my kids, that they will smoke marijuana in their houses. Do you know, it, it's, it's and, and everybody says that doesn't do anything. There's nothing wrong with marijuana. And, it, and I have medical crazy and the psychosis. So that myth that marijuana doesn't do anything. And, and, and another problem is edibles. If somebody smokes marijuana, you smell it. Somebody has edibles. Actually, do you, I lived there for eight years. I remember one of my former students, I saw him two years ago. And I asked him, how many do you eat? You know, because socially it affects you because you're talking with somebody that with edibles, they will be like, oh, oh. Yeah, seriously, it's a... I, I'm so happy for this presentation. Really, thank you so much for bringing this. 
And um, I mean, to the, and I finished very quick with patients in the dental school. You don't ask, do you smoke? You ask, how much do you smoke? Okay. So it's, it's that bad. I, I read Corey that it's breaking. I apologize, but I don't know what to do with that. Okay. Sorry that I, it took a long time to, with my comment. No, thank you for your comment. It's a completely different culture, but you can see that the legislation in North, in North Carolina was written by the similar people who wrote the legislation in Colorado. And uh, once you have this industry, it drives the culture. There's an incentive, financial incentive to do that. So thank you for your comment. Does anybody have any other questions or comments or concerns, or you can oh, chat oh, away here. I'm monitoring talk, the chat. Talk to us a little bit about the, the economics. What is it from the legislation and tax uh, income? Uh, that's a great incentive, I think, for our legislature, but I'm, I don't know. But could you shed some light on that? Yeah, I was... Um, as I mentioned, there would be a 10% tax on revenue from the medical marijuana centers. And so that supposedly would pay for all this regulatory structure. Maybe. In my opinion, in my opinion, truthfully, as I mentioned, alcohol and tobacco taxes pay for a 10th of their actual cost. So what will happen is There'll be some people who will get really rich off this commercialization and the rest of us will end up paying for it. I see a question here. Thank you, Mr. Cox. Uh, do you have any resources that we can give to patients who are using or asking questions like a handout with all this info in an easy to read format and charts um you know what um i have a couple thoughts on that um you know national institute on drug abuse drugabuse.gov i can put it here in the chat has some nice information that's credible uh, my website has um information and um you know i think a great way to bring this up is uh hey especially with kid but anybody um hey can i give you some brief information or brief advice um sure i've only had one patient my entire life say no and i use this with my kids too it works with kids and grandkids um marijuana is really toxic to brain development what do you think about what i just said and when it's framed in that kind of like asking permission providing the advice and then asking what they think about the advice tends to be received pretty well. Great question. Comment on the effect of smoking marijuana on the lungs versus cigarettes. That's a great question. Okay. So great question. So, Marijuana smoke has all the same carcinogens that tobacco smoke has in it. And marijuana smoke causes some of the precancerous changes that tobacco smoke does. The epidemiological evidence so far though has not found a clear link between marijuana smoking and lung cancer, which is really interesting. There may be, um, something in marijuana that counteracts the effect of the carcinogenic effect of the smoke. Regardless, there's a myth out there that I smoke cigarettes, it's okay because I also smoke marijuana. That is a myth. Like marijuana is not gonna protect anybody from that if they're also smoking. Um, marijuana smoking clearly causes um, bronchitis, um, exacerbation of COPD, um, also clearly increases the odds of having a heart attack and a stroke after using. Um, because it 
puts extra pressure, uh, extra load on the heart and lungs um, and has a lot of carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide in it as well. Um, so yeah, it's not good for lungs. Um, let's see here. Slides will be available as well as the video. Absolutely, I stand by what I say, so feel free to use the slides. Chris, alcohol versus marijuana, better or worse? That's such a great question because that is the, you know, we have legal alcohol and so um, why not have legal marijuana? So, you know, alcohol as it's used by 80 plus percent of the population is very responsible. And uh, you can have a few sips of alcohol, whereas um, who uses marijuana for some other reason than to get high? Like by definition, you get high when you use marijuana. So there's, I think, a, an important distinction there as well. Um, I also think that our history with alcohol al and the way we regulate alcohol is uh, a perfect case in point as to why we don't want to regulate marijuana like we regulate alcohol. I mean, alcohol is the third leading cause of death in the United States. And, um, and then even so, I was really surprised to see that North Carolina would consider having marijuana stores throughout the state when it still, doesn't North Carolina still have ABC stores? So like we would be, you guys would be like totally leapfrogging alcohol with this piece of legislation. And if North Carolina must do it, having government run stores for marijuana would ensure that the public reaps the revenue um, to pay for all the cost, the social costs that you would be having as well. Um, and it would be a way to not commercialize it so much. You'd take away the advertising and marketing incentive if marijuana were sold through government stores. Um, I proposed that in Colorado. As you can imagine, it went over like a lead balloon because it meant that people wouldn't be able to move in and get their profits. That's what it was about the whole time. It took a long time to get tobacco free public spaces. Um, does Colorado have marijuana free smoke zones? If so, what did it take to get in that place? I'm so glad you asked that question because our legislation also similar to North Carolina's prohibits public consumption of marijuana. But that's a joke. As Fernando said, you know, notice told us that's a joke. I mean, you go in Denver, you go with your kids to the park and 10 times out of 10, you and your kids will be smelling marijuana all around you. And uh, it's just too hard to enforce once you have caregivers and centers and testing facilities and you guys will have transportation as well as well as patients and it's like it becomes unenforceable after a while and um, now having said that some in Colorado we actually have counties that can opt out of marijuana commercialization and I actually moved my family to one of those counties and it's been a, literally no pun intended a breath of fresh air um, that would not be available to you in North Carolina under this legislation because the marijuana centers need to be evenly spread out throughout the state, which really surprised me to see that. Like it's one thing you'd expect Guilford County, Durham County, Orange County to have the medical marijuana centers, but I think they're, I don't know, what about Cherokee County or something like that? They would also be forced to have their marijuana centers. Um, do the edibles make you high or only provide medical pain relief? The edibles get people very high, in fact, too high. As I said, um, you can have 100 gram, you can have 100 milligrams of THC in a soda when an actual serving size tends to be about 10 milligrams. And so you could have 10 servings in one soda. And so what happens is in the time to maximum blood concentration is about two and a half hours, people feel nothing with their first soda. They have another soda and then they really, it hits them like a brick wall and they feel very high and they're not supposed, I was reading the recommendations, they're not supposed to 
drive for about eight hours after consuming orally like that. Uh, so it really gets people quite high. Um, yeah. And Google 420 in Colorado. Yes, you can uh, get on the internet and see what is a little bit more of what it's been like and what it's like to have a, a marijuana store on, on each street corner. Great questions. Anything else? Just going to say, I read an article today that um, refers to an article in Forbes, which I don't didn't read, that says only about one third of the marijuana industry is kind of going through the legal process, that two thirds of it is illegal and unregulated, and it's increasing crime and other things. Um, so I don't know if you have any comments about that. Yeah, I mean, I think that is a really good comment because um, what happened is people say in Colorado, we took away the black market, but really Colorado became the black market. And we know that Colorado is just exporting a lot of marijuana. And that's, uh, that's an issue with states regulating this. States don't have the infrastructure to control their borders and imports and exports and that becomes a federal issue. And um, certainly um, this has not gotten rid of uh, the black market, even in Colorado. Um, it just made the whole thing unenforceable by creating a, a complex system, which is exactly what the legislation in North Carolina is, uh, is preparing to do. Chris, a question is, I don't think any data of this, and this is a personal observation. Since the, when 2013, the everything that was a massive explosion of the marijuana in Colorado, I personally saw the crime spiking. Actually, even before moving here, uh, somebody pointed a gun on me in front of my house. I don't know if you're familiar with Northfield in Denver. That's, it's a good area. And yeah, and, and we had break-ins and, and, and well, now we have the the homeless uh, shelters in, in downtown. And by the way, it's something comment uh, to you, Jeff. When we, we did a road trip very quickly, so in Colorado, the place are in the front and the back. I was uh, pulled over three times the same day. Well, I, I, stupid things like going uh, five miles over the limit because they see the Colorado plate and they pull you over to see if you have marijuana. Because what Chris was just saying, you know, and and, and Chris, is any data on the uh, crime spike in, in in Colorado? Yeah, we were really we were promised that this would reduce crime, and it did not reduce crime. Um, crime went up, um, and it did not reduce drug related crime, and it did not reduce um, arrests um, of people in of people of color. So this was also presented as an equity issue. And none of those things that we were promised came true. Um, you also reminded me too, Denver had a significant increase, especially early on in homelessness and people coming to Colorado and presenting to homeless shelters, uh, partly because of the very liberal drug policies here. And so put extra strain on the homeless shelters and social services as well. It's an excellent point. With the... Uh... AMA and the FDA and neurologists and psychiatrists continuing to say, do not legalize medical marijuana. We're finding harms. Do keep studying. Why is any part of the medical profession considering it medicine when all these groups are saying no? You know, that's an excellent question. So you, I'm glad you asked it because it raises some important points here. So first of all, um, there's not a single reputable medical organization, whether it's the psychiatrists, the surgeons, the ophthalmologists, the neurologists, the oncologists, there's not a single reputable medical organization that's calling for this. Yet, we have our legislatures are playing doctor and deciding what's medicine and what's not medicine, which is clearly outside of scope in my opinion a scope of practice, in my opinion. Um, so having said that also, you know, I can speak very clearly to 
post-traumatic stress disorder, that is within my scope, where the literature as a whole shows worse outcomes among veterans with, who have PTSD and use marijuana, more um, likely to die by suicide and more likely to have aggression. And uh, so you're actually potentially producing harm in those cases. Um, also, why would physicians do this? Um, we had, especially early on, it was about 10 physicians who were doing 80% of the marijuana recommending. And as I mentioned, one of them was a radiologist who had, he had a medical license, but he also had um, some complaints against his license. And so this was something he could continue to do. And it's extremely lucrative. Um, about $100 per medical marijuana evaluation, and then just pump those out cash um, all day long. It can be extremely lucrative for some physicians to do this. And last I saw, 90% of physicians in Colorado have never recommended marijuana. So it tends to be a few physicians who see a business opportunity who then go for it. Um, what in interventions are there for overuse? How do you get off weed besides going to rehab? Yeah, so overuse, if somebody is like psychotic, having a panic attack, that's um, supportive treatments, um, maybe with some medicine, some reassurance, calm, quiet environment. Um, in terms of if somebody develops a cannabis use disorder or addiction to marijuana, which yes, marijuana is addictive, not just psychologically, but physically. There's no, debat of, no doubt about that in the medical literature anymore. Marijuana causes addiction. It um, stimulates dopamine secretion in the brain reward circuit, just as cocaine and methamphetamine and nicotine and alcohol do, all drugs of abuse. Increase the amount of dopamine in the shell of the nucleus accumbens and the brain reward circuit. So absolutely, it is an addictive substance and the treatment of choice is um, different types of psychotherapy. And there is no current medication for cannabis use disorder. Um, so it actually can be a little bit hard to treat, you know, in, in comparison to opioid use disorder where we have some really great medications, uh, we don't really have that for marijuana. So treatment of choice is psychotherapy, um, which is effective. Uh, about 50% of kids who have psychotherapy for cannabis use disorder achieve abstinence. Um, I hear about marijuana being a gateway drug. Um, do you see that? Yes. So using marijuana in adolescence uh, predicts about a two to threefold increased risk of using other substances. Um, I say, yes, I'm worried about that. But even if they don't go on to use other substances, which is the vast majority of kids, I'm still quite worried about it because of its toxic effect on brain development and social development. Um, are there educational materials or programs geared toward informing children? Uh, Chris, 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 I'm so yeah. sorry. Oh, Go ahead. Oh, Chris, I'm so sorry that you mentioned teenagers. I'm going to share with everybody uh, the worst cases that I saw in Colorado. 15 year old, okay, who needed every single tooth to be extracted and have dentures. 15, okay, mm -hmm. why the extraction? Because of first, meth. But okay, no, I don't use meth, but now I'm smoking marijuana every day. Mm -hmm. And you wanna hear the words? She had a two year old baby. You mm -hmm. cannot imagine how many cases, every time we saw somebody in the 20s that needed dentures, ah, we knew it. In those cases, we didn't ask, do you say, are you still using meth? Do you, do you smoke marijuana? Most commonly, no, I don't use meth, but I smoke marijuana every day. Because the, for them, marijuana is not, it's not bad. And mm -hmm. you cannot imagine how many cases we saw. With tw the worst, I said the 15-year-old, but how many cases people in their 20s? And usually they will come with an adult and you talk to them and they answer very weird, they give you very weird answers. What are you talking about? Seriously, it, it was very, very sad. And, and again, mm -hmm. and thank you so much for this uh, 
presentation because I love to hear somebody saying the same thing that I'm repeating over and over in the nano school at UNC. Uh, thank, thank you for doing this. And I promise I shut up. <laughs> no, I love your comment. And absolutely, um, marijuana use is associated with dental caries. Yes? Yeah. That's what I've seen. So dental cavities as well, another side effect that I didn't even mention. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, so let's see here. Are there educational materials or programs geared towards informing children and young teens about the dangers of marijuana use? There are, um, like for example, um, I'll put it in the chat here. Uh, NIDA goes back to school as one. Partnership for Drug-Free Kids um, is another. Um, so there are some materials out there. And again, I recommend the basic framework. Hey, can I give you some brief advice or information? Yes, give the information and ask what they think about it. it tends to be received much better when it's uh, framed in that way. And you know, we need to end on some good news too here. Um, the strongest protector against substance use that we have for kids is a strong, loving, warm relationship with their caregivers. Um, it's basic attachment theory. Um, you know, in some ways we're no different than any other mammal and uh, a strong connection to one's caregivers is highly protective against all sorts of mental health and substance issues. So that's, you know, ending on a good note too. There's a lot we can do. Chris, I just wanted to thank you for your time this evening. I want to be respectful of that as well. Uh, I know you've had a long day. Um, I, I did want to remind everybody that if you want a copy of the video or the slides or both, uh, please just email me and I'd be happy to provide those uh, to you. I hope this is the beginning of conversations for a lot of you. Um, whether you're in legislation or medicine, um, but that this is a, a great resource for you to share with others, to have those conversations and, and maybe to have some influence in our community. Um, and I'm sure Dr. Thurstone is uh, open to an email or two as well if you have uh, further questions in the future, and I'm sure we'll be bringing them around uh, with the Christian Medical Dental Association as well, uh, bring them back into our orbit so, uh, so thank you, Dr. Thurstone, for this evening. I want to thank all of you for taking your time this evening and joining us. Corey, everybody needs to call their legislator or email them. Put the pressure on the legislature. There you go. Yeah, if you want a copy of this and forward it to whoever your representative is and, um, and start putting some pressure on them. We are going to, just so you know, we are going to send this out in January when the legislature comes back together. We're going to have a, a link to it online, as well as the slides um, in an effort to bring this information before the legislature. So at least they're making a more informed decision and not just an economic or political one. So, uh, so thank you all. I'm going to uh, close out the meeting now, and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of the week. Thank you again, Dr. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. That was fun. Great to see everybody.